and Barbara. It's nice to hear that organ. Love that sound, but I may be a little prejudiced in that uh, regard. Uh, coming from a position as organist in another place. Um, so let us um, make sure that we know that anyone who would love to sing with us is aware that uh, choir practice takes place on Thursday evenings at 7.30. So if you're sitting in the congregation and you'd rather be up here, um, come and join us for rehearsal. And <laughs> And Jeff endorses that announcement, I guess. Hallelujah. Uh, other than that, um, be sure and come downstairs for time of fellowship after the service here. Um, not sure who prepared it today, but it was Jeff and Lori. Good. So looking forward to some time together to share in fellowship after our worship service this morning. And if there are no other announcements, oh, we do have another announcement. Sorry. Cheryl. Um, I just wanted to talk about the refreshments downstairs. I am so grateful for everybody signing up for the coffee hour um, through November and all through December, except for December 18th. Um, and there'll be no coffee hour Christmas morning. But thank you very much that have signed up. Um, there are extra supplies in the closets cabinets in the kitchen. The only thing that people may have to buy is cream. Save your receipts. I will reimburse you. Thank you. Okay. So we have fellowship all set for a long time. Nice. For th almost through the end of the year. So praise God for that. That's a good Methodist thing, by the way, to get together for food. Right? Um, so uh, without any other um, announcements, I just want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and uh, invite you to join in the call to worship, which is a responsive one as we usually do. So you are righteous, O Lord, and your judgments are right. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. Your, your decrees, decrees are righteous forever. forever. Give, Give me, me understanding, understanding that, that I may live. And that's taken from Psalm 119, which is the longest one in our Bible. So it's hard to choose just three verses out of it. 
but we did. So now I will give you the opportunity to um, pick a song to sing this morning. Yes, Pam. 261? 261. Lord of the Dance. <laughs> I will do one verse since we're doing three different hymns. What verse morning. would you like to do, Pam? First, first, okay. first verse. Verse one, number 261, Lord of the Dance. <laughs> I danced in the morning when the world was begun And I danced in the moon and the stars and the sun And I came down from heaven and I danced on earth As Bethlehem I had my birth Dance, dance, wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance, said he And I'll lead you all wherever you Said he. 364. All right, we got 364 and then 494. 364. First verse. First verse. We'll do two verses. We'll do first verse and we'll do the we'll do verse one and verse six. sitting around the campfire with a guitar or maybe two or three uh, <laughs> and whatever else we had at hand. So thank you for um, choosing hymns this morning and let us continue our um, uh, service with our prayers, our time of prayer. We begin with our congregational prayer, 
as it's printed in the bulletin saying together, O Lord our God, give us such a heart for your people that we would be always in prayer for them as Paul and Timothy were for theirs. Stop us amid our hurried lives to remember those in need when you bring them to our mind. Lord, when we hear the scream of the ambulance or the police car sirens, let us remember those who are in distress. When we hear of a need in casual conversation, remind us to bring that to you, that you may intervene immediately. For all people are your people, your creation from the beginning of their lives as we are. Help us to love them as you love them and grant them the same care that you grant, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, our Christ, we pray. Amen. And as we continue in a spirit of prayer, I would ask if there are any that we need to add to our prayer list today or that uh, we have a joy to share. Bill. Okay, Ed Hollister is back in rehab. Oh. Okay, so we'll keep Ed in our prayers at rehab. Are there others? Or any updates on Oops. our prayer list? Hello. Jeannie. <laughs> Hi. Um, just a prayer of thanks that Brian recovered from COVID, even though he is sleeping. Uh, <laughs> and um, just continued prayers for Brian's house as they remain in quarantine and probably will do so for at least another 10 days. So where they can't reveal exactly what's going on, it sounds like this is going through their house. So... Okay. Well, thank God for Brian's recovery. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jeannie. Yes, Joanne. Yes, indeed, for Cheryl and her upcoming surgery. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask. He wants to sing at the choir Thursday night and then have surgery afterwards. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I have a personal request this morning for my wife as she is experiencing a um, time of uh, pancreatitis attack this morning. So she's in a quite a bit of pain and um, um, would appreciate your prayers for her recovery from that. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Pastor Dan, I have a, a good, a joyful one. Okay, Jody. Um, is a, a little one, Gabriel, yes. is uh, being weaned off the respirator and other medicines and doing wonderful. Great. So Gabriel is, is weaned off of the respirator and other medicines as well. Right. And hopefully in five days, she'll be home. Five days? All right. So we'll lift a, a word of praise next Sunday for her return home. Amen. Right. All right. Good. That's great. We love to have good news. God is good and always at work, right? Did I see a hand back there? <laughs> no, okay. All right, oh, this is Barbara. Yes. Yes, and um, I do actually have a card that she sent to everyone. So I will share that after our service today. Uh, yes, we did have a nice visit with Ruth O'Connor in her um, uh, nursing home where she's 
living now. Uh, and she was uh, very gracious to receive a whole room full of visitors, uh, had to move out of her room to do it. Uh, and uh, that, that was a great time. So thank you all for, for everybody for, for going that did. Yes, Cheryl? Just another joy. I'm talking about Ruth O'Connor. There was a couple flyers in the fellowship hall and one in the choir room. I put up, let's celebrate Ruth's 94th birthday on November 22nd. There is an address, please. I'm asking people to send cards. And I know that she would be surprised and really extremely happy. Thank you. 94, you said? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. If, I, I suppose we've already shared it, so it's too late to withhold. Oh, no, she didn't <laughs> Okay, so Ruth is turning 94 next month. Wow, that, that's a wonderful celebration for sure. Um, we do have another celebration sitting in our choir. Brian has been uh, ill for a few weeks and uh, he's recovered and uh, joining us today. Um, So uh, I understand that Rachel Christensen has returned home. So she's improved as well. And uh, okay, well, we'll take better for sure. And Emerson, any updates on on the mend? On the mend. So praise God for that as well. We have some joys today. Hallelujah. So in that spirit, let us continue in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you that uh, people on our prayer list are improving and, uh, and coming home soon after long periods of, of uh, recovery. We think especially of Gabriel Hope um, being weaned off the respirator and other meds and, um, and seeking to return home in less than a week. So we look forward to celebrating her coming, homecoming next week. And uh, we thank you that you have worked well in the lives of Rachel and Emerson and uh, have both of them on the mend and Brian recovered from his flu. And, uh, and we ask for your continued presence with Ed as he's found himself back in rehab after relapse at home. We, we ask for your presence with Janet as she's dealing with that bout of pancreatitis this morning. And we also um, thank you for Ruth uh, O'Connor, who is about to celebrate her 94th birthday in a few weeks. Uh, we thank you that uh, she is um, in, in a good place um, and in good health. And we praise you for, for all of those things and all of those people on our list that are improving in their health. And we ask for those that are still grieving the losses of family members that your presence will continue to be with them, your love manifest in their lives. And for those that are in other states of need that you would continue to make your presence known to them in their lives. We have an extensive list and you know every need and every joy. So we, we celebrate your presence 
we celebrate your love and your grace. And we thank you especially for, the, uh, for your sending your son to us. And we, we pray the prayer now that he taught his disciples saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I would invite the choir to come forward to celebrate some worship in music as they sing. Go not far from me, O God. Sing of 
Now is the time that we re return to our New Testament reading. This reading is taken from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. In the opening verses to the first chapter and a couple of verses following. And it reads like this. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly. And the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith during all your persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. To this end, we always pray for you asking that our God will make you worthy of his call and will fulfill by his power every good resolve and work of faith, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. May we hear in these words the word of the Lord. And as we continue in our scripture, we'll turn to the gospel. Now, by this time in the earthly ministry of Jesus, he had gained quite a following. He could go almost nowhere without a crowd on his heels. In the previous chapter of Luke's gospel here, Jesus had taken some time with his closest disciples and explained the passion that was soon to follow. That is his trial and hanging and death. But with such a huge following that constantly surrounded them, those disciples did not understand how this could happen. But Jesus continued his teaching in and among the crowds that were his constant accompaniment after his predictions to these incredulous disciples. And his passing through the land led him to Jericho, where the chief tax collector Zacchaeus was headquartered. This most hated man among the Jews had heard of Jesus and his curiosity got the better of him as he sought a way to find out who this Jesus was. Little did he know that Jesus would single him out of all of those who were in the crowd. So let's listen to Luke's telling of this story from the 19th chapter, the first 10 verses. 
He entered Jericho and was passing through it, that is Jesus. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek out and to save the lost. May we hear in these words the gospel of the Lord. Let us join now in hymn number 378, Amazing Grace. All verses, if you're able to rise, let us sing.
days of heaven are long days, amen? Well, we've been there 10,000 years. We're just beginning. Hallelujah. So my sermon today is entitled to seek out and to save the lost. Now Jesus was, shall we say, a bit unconventional in his approach to ministry in his days on the earth. He was certainly popular among the people because of his growing reputation for delivering many from physical infirmities and mental distresses, even from demonic possession. Many who followed him in those days were drawn from the masses healed by his touch or his word. Just before this account of the calling of the tax collector, one in the crowd was a blind man who had been given back his sight and joined the others in following Jesus. It seems the whole population of the city had turned out to see this Jesus, and that presented a problem for this rich businessman. This one whom the residents of the city and the focus of his business were, shall we say, not too fond of. But he was accustomed to overcoming obstacles in the normal course of achieving his business objectives. And he found a unique way to overcome this one, this need to see Jesus. He ran ahead and climbed a tree. What do you suppose motivated this chief tax collector to want to see Jesus? Maybe the reputation that preceded him? Maybe the following of all these people who seem to always be in his presence? Did this tax collector see in Jesus someone he wanted to be? You know, like popular? Zacchaeus was probably one of the most unpopular people in the town because of his occupation. Maybe he was feeling a bit lonely and was trying to figure out why this man was so sought out. Perhaps he could incorporate some of the charm or charisma of Jesus into his own life and turn his loneliness around. Maybe by getting a glimpse of the person of Jesus, he could figure out how to turn his own life around or discover something about Jesus that could give him, Zacchaeus, some other advantage over others. Or maybe, it was simply the opportunity to see this person who generated such interest and passion among the populace. Like having the opportunity to see your favorite artist in person, in concert, in your own hometown. Probably the last thing this tax collector expected was to be noticed by Jesus. But noticed he was, not only noticed, but called out of his perch in the tree to escort the Lord to his very house for a meal. Jesus wanted to fellowship with this most sinful of men. And don't you know that created a beehive of commentary on the part of the ordinary people in the crowd? How could the Lord deem it necessary to eat with a chief sinner? Why would he lower himself to share a meal with such a hated individual among all the people he could have chosen to do so? You know, the good people of town, the upright and obedient, the people who put others before themselves, the honest among us. 
It seems like mixing oil and water for such a good one as Jesus to associate for even a short time with someone so vile and selfish, not only for a visit, but for a meal. Now that would take a while. Wasn't Jesus afraid of being polluted himself by this one? Did he really know who he was asking? But Jesus knew something the crowd did not. For Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. There was something in the curiosity of Zacchaeus that was more than mere curiosity. There was an awakening in his soul that Jesus might have something to offer him that might change his life. This was more than a need to know what Jesus looked like. This was a yearning for an encounter that just might rescue him from a life that had taken him far from his God. Oh, he was quite comfortable financially, having all he needed for his own pleasure in addition to meeting his every earthly need. But how could he be happy when he had drifted so far from God? This Jesus whom he sought came with a reputation for doing the will of God throughout the country and even beyond. He had met the needs of many for healing and wholeness, had fed thousands who were hungry at his seminars on the plains, and had come unprepared for meeting their own need for food. If he wasn't God, he was certainly one who was close to God, Maybe merely being in his presence would have a restorative effect on Zacchaeus. But of all the people surrounding the Lord on those streets, Jesus singled out the one who had climbed a tree to see him. Yes, Jesus saw Zacchaeus above the crowd and Jesus called him by name to come down from the tree. When Jesus calls, when we hear our own name called from the heights of heaven, we must respond. Zacchaeus shimmied down that tree and fixed a lavish meal for Jesus in his own home. He opened himself up to the presence of the Lord. And right then and there, he repented of all the errors of his past. Of the times he took more from his clients than he needed to and spent it on himself. Of the hoarding of his riches to himself, when all around him, there were many who could not support themselves and needed some help. He made right all the things he had done wrong. His heart was immediately changed in the presence of Jesus. And he did something about the way he was living that was contrary to the law of God. We probably should say that he resolved to clean himself up in the sight of God. For this redistribution of riches, he promised, could not take place in an instant as his heart was changed, but had to process over time. His heart was changed in that instant, but his new life of obedience to God could only manifest over time. 
And as I was thinking about this instantaneous change in the heart of Zacchaeus, I began to think about that same kind of thing in myself. I had the experience of Jesus calling my name and my response to him to repent or turn my life around to more conformity what, uh, to what God requires of his children. I was trying to run my life as I saw fit to run it, not thinking that God might have different ideas about life than I did. I had grown up in a house that believed in God and had learned that there were certain moral boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. I had been trained in Sunday school and at home in the ways of God and tried to live them out in my own strength. My school experience, especially in high school, of being that extremely skinny kid carrying that arm full of books all day, being the target of those who looked upon my stature as perhaps grotesque in its difference from most of the others around and marked me for ridicule as one to dominate physically skewed my view of life in a negative way. My response to their bullying was not necessarily very Christian. Dwelling endlessly on ways to turn their hurting of me back on them. I lived with internal hatred and resentment toward those who I felt wronged me for a long time. I constantly ran scenarios in my head where I turned out victorious over those who were so inconsiderate of me. I was a bit socially awkward, unable to relate to those who put me down. And church became my outlet for positive interaction with others. The place where I could function somewhat as a human being among my peers. Still, a lot of my time was spent away from others. Studying for schoolwork and practicing music, which was for me a passion and something that accorded me some amount of praise and positive recognition and allowed me to reevaluate my worth in society. And then Jesus called my name. In an instant, that burden of hurt and resentment was lifted from me. I felt immediately lighter, accepted, loved by the one who called. I knew I could leave the old things behind me, that resentment and that reluctance to forge relationships with others because of the past hurts. I had a new start, but the process of building a new life under the watchful eye of God was just that, a process. I had to learn the specifics and embrace the way of life Jesus called me to and leave behind the way of life I had forged on my own. I had to learn what God required all over again, to be transformed by the renewing of my mind, as Paul urged those in the Roman church to do. That instant of change, that beginning of the renewal of my mind, 
was 46 years ago now. And I'm still learning what God requires. And I intend to be doing so as long as God grants me time in this flesh. I have not regretted releasing all those bad things to God and never had a second thought about the changes I needed to make to be used by God. As the hymn says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was found by Jesus. And if you are feeling a bit lost in your life, you can be found too. All it takes is a listening ear, an attentive spirit, an openness to the call of God. Come, Daniel. Come and insert your own name. Can you hear your name being called? Because Jesus is seeking you. Jesus is calling you to salvation, to peace, to the beginning of a transformed life. Amen. 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 Now we turn to a time to collect our offerings and tithes. And uh, I believe Jeff is going to share uh, some music during this time. So feel free to bring your offering if you haven't already to the front. <clears throat> I travel down a lonely road and no one seemed to care. The burden on my weary back had bowed me to despair. I oft complained to Jesus how folks were treating me. And then I heard him say so tenderly. My feet were all so weary upon the Calvary road. The cross became so heavy, I fell beneath the load. Be faithful, weary pilgrim, the morning I can see. Just lift your cross and follow close to me. Jesus, if I die upon a foreign land someday, t'would be no more than love demands, no less could I repay. No greater love hath mortal man than for a friend to die. These are the words he gently spoke to me. If just a cup of water I place within your hand, then just a cup of water is all that I demand. But if by death to living they can thy glory see. I'll take my cross and follow close to thee.
Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these gifts that have come forward today. We ask that your blessing be upon their destination and that your um, blessings would be with all of those who are receiving because of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now it's time again for you to choose our final hymns. 431, I hear. She had it turned up for me to sing the piece for the offering, and I don't think we turned it back down for the doxology. We were all singing up a little bit higher. 431. Sixty one Rock of Ages will send the first verse. Oh. 
service of hymns. Um, so um, maybe if you want to suggest some that you would like to do in a time like that, um, I'm open uh, almost any time for that. Now let us uh, join in our congregational prayer for renewal at this time as it's printed in your bulletin. O oh, Lord our God, who is enthroned in heaven and lives by your Holy Spirit on the earth in us, your people, we praise you. We come together to learn of your love for us and your will for us. We ask you, O oh Lord, to open our minds to that will for each of us, to reveal your plan and purpose for our lives. We ask for strength to carry out that purpose as faithful and obedient children, submitted in all ways to you, our loving Father. We ask that you bring us together in service to one another in the name of your precious and only Son, Jesus. Amen. Now may the God of grace and glory, the God of peace and grace his son Jesus and the spirit that lives within and around us here on the earth be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Have a nice week. You too, Judy. I'm glad Brian. I'm glad Brian's better. Yes, me too. Thank you. Now we gotta pray for the rest of them. Yes. <laughs> I know. You, I you're know. looking good. Bye now. Have a good week, everyone. You too. You too, Judy. You too. Sarah.